Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Uh, here in Sydney uh, for NDC City, home of wallabies, kangaroos, and other marmots. Marsupials. Mar okay. Marsupials. One of those. Yeah. I actually got to see some. Yeah. Uh, I went out during Magic Hour when I was down in Canberra. Saw uh, There's a bunch of kangaroos. They're very skittish, like deer, mm. around people. But uh, the wallabies were just very interested in my camera. They would just sit <laughs> up with their puffy ears and just look at you. That's cool. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, dogs eat kangaroo mints down here. Yeah, well, it's like dog food. Yeah. Anything's dog food if you try hard enough. Yeah. Well, you feed your dog crazy, crazy food. I feed my dog the herring. Yeah. If that's crazy, then okay. Well, it's crazier than canned dog food. I guess. Actually, it's probably a lot smarter, isn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, let's get started with... Uh, Better know framework. Awesome. All right, buddy, what do you got? Well, uh, on the last show we did, which was uh, the last .NET Rocks we recorded here today, mm. um, John Azaria told me about this because remember I talked about uh, Windows 95 and the browser as an Electron app? Yeah, yeah, which is crazy. It's crazy. Um, so he told me about Linux in the browser. Oh, Yes, that's right. The entire operating system. If you head over to bellard.org, that's B-E-L-L-A-R-D dot org slash J-S Linux, you can see that there are several operating systems that you can run in the browser here. Nice. Uh, even Windows 2000. Uh, oh. Windows 2000 in the browser. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, X window versions of Linux 4.15, Fedora 29. And uh, yeah. That's you crazy. Just click here and you might need to wait a little bit. I wonder if, I wonder if it's just a manifestation of Moore's law. That the right. computers have gotten so much more powerful now that we're just doing emulation of our old operating systems because we can. Well, have you ever called um, a remote desktop client? from a remote VM and into another remote, like you can go yeah, several layers it's, deep. It's inception -y and what you know is that it gets, gets slow. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It is. All right, that's well, cool. Well, this is, uh, you know, what can I say? Windows 2000 in a browser? Um, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm, I'm saying just saying I can do it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you could pull up a C compiler and write code mm -hmm. and compile it. All right. In a browser. Oh, Isn't my that's, goodness. That's what I got. Thanks, John, for that. Uh, who's talking to us, Richard? I grabbed a comment off a of show 1533, which we did back in April 2018, talking to Mr. Vishwas Lele about the Microsoft Business Application Platform, yep. which included Power BI, the mm -hmm. topic of our conversation today. Got a bunch of good comments on the show, as is usual for Vishwas' shows, because he's brilliant. He is. Uh, this particular comment I thought was really relevant. This is from Jason Brenner, who says, one of the points made on the show was that this product could help reduce the amount of work placed on IT staff to provide custom line of business apps. Mm. We were talking about the, the business application platforms, more of the platform pieces done for you, right? Mm -hmm. As a line of business application developer, I spend most of my days trying to meet the demand and only sometimes feeling like I've succeeded. When our team is really facing a crunch, sometimes we pull out the old standby. Microsoft Access. I was going to say Windows 2000 in a browser. <laughs> Access in a browser. <laughs> Access. It, yeah. Oh. It might not be pretty, but using Access to build a basic forms over data front end to a SQL back end is a quick way to put something into place. It's saving data to a central database that can then be included in external reports. And it lets staff continue their daily work without having to wait for IT to build yet another quote, full-size line of business app. Hmm. What Vishwas describes with the business application platform really strikes me as a modern alternative to that kind of access development. With businesses increasingly moving to Office 365, this could fill that role quite well. I would even consider the limited extensibility model as a plus since it avoids the temptation to trying to squeeze too much out of the platform. Hmm. Let's face it, while calling com objects from Access VBA can be done, I don't think it was ever really a good idea. Nope. It's best we had at the time at one point. <laughs> Jason speaking my language, old yeah. school stuff. And I do think it's, you know, this whole idea of Power BI is an embed and so forth. It's just right up. Mm -hmm. He needs to know this. He does. So thanks for sharing some insight about the platform. This might be a new tool to add to our team's development toolbox. Absolutely, Jason. I think uh, Power BI is well going to be a good one for that. So thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code by is on its way to you, and if you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at dotnetrocks.com or via any of our social media, because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. 
And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We save them to an access database with a DDE link. <laughs> uh, I'll give you ten. Four point three. I'll give you ten <laughs> bucks to anybody who can define DDE. <laughs> no, not you. I know you can. All right. Uh, let's uh, introduce Peter Myers. He's here with us. He's worked at, uh, with Microsoft Database and Development Products since 1997. And today, he specializes in all Microsoft data products and provides mentoring, technical training, and technical content authoring for SQL Server, Office, SharePoint, Azure, and Power BI. Peter has a broad business background supported by a bachelor's degree in applied economics and accounting, and he extends this with solid experience backed by current MCSE certifications. He's been a SQL Server MVP since 2007. Pleasure to meet you, Peter. Pleasure Welcome. to meet you guys, and thank you for having me on your show. Awesome. And thanks for being here. This is a really cool conference halfway around the world from where I live, because I'm meeting all these people that I've never met before, mm -hmm. and we're having that new blood. Old school MVPs, like, yeah. you know, have been working in tech for a long time. You did, have the old guy conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you do your talk yet here? So I, uh, I did a breakout session yesterday on Power BI, and I did three workshops today. Holy uh, so I, I'm all done, except apparently one interview to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully it's still fresh in your mind. Um, so for Power BI, people who are new to it, why would you want to use Power BI, and what is it good for? All right, maybe a little bit of background. So, yeah. so it's interesting that I find myself here in Sydney just meters away from an office building that in 97 I used to work in. Okay. Oh, wow. And uh, I joined the Australian National Line as a, um, a business analyst looking after shipping statistics. And in those days, the tool of choice was Lotus 123. Right. right. And yeah. so I'm reminded because I actually walked by my old office building here. And then you mentioned access. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I found myself in the doldrums in this role for a while that they, there wasn't a lot to do. And curiosity got the better of me. And I found on the desktop there was something called Access 2. Mm -hmm. And if I double clicked on it and I experimented enough, I could coerce data into this structure called a table. And then it gave me this enormous power to do what I was manually doing all through those keystroke macros in Lotus mm. 1, 2, 3, right? Right, right. And so that was a pivotal moment in my life because... No pun intended. Uh. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Where it led me was from a career in shipping um, to a career in data about shipping, which was oh, just right. one stepping a stone from data to do with anything. But you, you were a domain expert because you'd worked in shipping for so long. So, Correct. you know, you had the magic ingredient. Mm. So, you know, I ended that role. I ended up backpacking around the world for a while. I came back to Melbourne, my home city. And uh, I landed this job for three months as a, a temporary superintendent of shipping scheduling around the coast. And they were having an access development project to schedule their system. And I took one look at it and I went, I knew that this wouldn't work because I knew the industry and I knew the way that, you know, ship scheduling works and, right. and that schedules are dynamic. Right. I don't want to see port one, port two, port three as the columns of a table right. because, you know, we <laughs> rotate ports and we do all sorts of things. So I sort of, you know, challenged in the most professional way I could, the developer that was doing this and revealed that they didn't have the domain knowledge in shipping. Right. And it would actually be faster to teach me and fill my gaps in access development at that point Wow. to, to then write the application for them. And mm -hmm. they agreed. And it was a year later that I turned around a full-fledged application. Wow. But to this day, they still run. And the funny story about that in is... In Access. In Access. Oh, my goodness. Now, it was Access 97 in the day. It has been upgraded, I think, you to would Office hope. 2007. Yeah. Okay, so it's only 10 years behind, not 20. But believe me when I tell you I get a call last year, and I'm not going to name the customer. Wait, and they want to put it on the internet. They're like, <laughs> are you the guy that wrote this database? I mean, the awesome database? Yes. It's amazing. Yes, that <laughs> database. And it's like, oh, well, could you help us? It's running slow. And I'm like... It's running. <laughs> it's running, <laughs> period. Yeah. So, you know, I got a glance back at it, and, and I'm just so impressed years later to see what I developed with very little assistance. Sure. You remember the Bible books you'd have years ago? I would read them cover to cover. Yeah. Um, anyway, where did that lead me? From a transport economist with a shipping background that somehow worked out access. Yep. Um, I then decided to become a SQL Server expert. It just seemed the next logical step to up, you know, scale up from access. Mm. Uh, and I was in the right place at the right time because having sort of, I'll say mastered SQL Server, sufficient to be a DBA and a database developer, mm. um, someone grabbed hold of me to say, well, look, would you be interested in doing training? And my sort of interesting background had been that I did music performance at school, mm -hmm. which didn't lead to a career, but I just enjoyed it. Uh, it was also um, something I did as a backpacker was teaching English to foreign language students. So right. I'm a formal CELTA trained professional. Yeah. And then I have this knowledge of databases and the combination of three was something that was in demand at the time that you could have someone that had 
knowledge, information, passion, and could entertain. Mm -hmm. And so I landed up being an MCT for a while. Okay. So, yeah. you know, having learned, you know, all of the SQL Server courses, .NET came out at this point. So even pre-release for .NET, I was working on an ASP.NET project. Mm. So it was, it was more serendipity that I arrived. Right place, right time. Where I did. And yeah. then it was the explosion of analysis services in SQL Server, which, by the way, has its 20th birthday. Yeah, yeah. In, in November. So there was a gap to be filled. They wanted right. experts that could do this. And what I most appreciate about moving into the BI space is that it's perhaps one of the most creative areas. Mm -hmm. You know, working with data and creative solutions, whether it's data warehouse design through to modeling, through to reporting dashboards, mm. and, and then the challenge on how to distribute and share that, mm. um, that it just seems a perfect fit. Sure. So from that point forward, you know, I've been a data analytics guy. And I've been very closely aligned with Microsoft. So whatever they've been doing in the space, whether it's SharePoint BI, if you can remember performance point services. Right. Well, of course, mean, you go BI. all the way back to 98, you're talking about OLAP server, right? Which is a well, purchase product. Correct. Yeah. So that's the way the 20th birthday comes in, that mm -hmm. it's actually 20 years in 98 that we saw it released as what part of SQL 7. Yeah. SQL yeah. Server 7, right? So I didn't join it at that point. I came in when it was rebranded as analysis services right. with the 2000 release. Mm. And in 2004, we had reporting services and then mm -hmm. Integration services and the new 2005 platform. Um, so I've had this remarkable career that's just been in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And um, and I've got to say, what's really driven me is just that I enjoy doing what I do. Sure. And so that's evolved to the self-service story. That's been a more recent BI story from Microsoft. So. Um, I think your point about the pivotal was what Power Pivot. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Power Pivot coming out as this amazing engine built through an add-in into Excel 2010, mm -hmm. which was actually part of the SQL Server 2008 R2 release. So we then saw this fragmentation that yes, we still have corporate BI and the SQL Server story. Right. But then we've got this branching out. We've got a whole new audience to engage. The Excel people. The Excel people. Yeah. You know, how can we take your you know sometimes very good-looking worksheet reports? You know, mm -hmm. I've seen some remarkable. Remarkable I'm things stunned. that don't even yeah, look like yeah. worksheets as well. But when you can show that with relative ease, you can take that same data, just import it into the workbook data model, and then you've got a whole new ability to not just um, surface that data, but add business logic that is something that even Excel couldn't achieve. So mm -hmm. Logic, mm. time intelligence is a great example. And then providing new ways to visualize that. So the Excel story took us so far, and then Microsoft has I won't say abandoned that path, but they've certainly de-emphasized that Office is the platform for self-service BI. Mm. And with the birth of you know, a software as a service, business intelligence with Power BI, and I'm the walking billboard for it with this bright yellow shirt, um, the most interesting years I would say in my career have been the past two, mm -hmm. because I've never witnessed such rapid change uh, and evolution and responsiveness to customer needs from Microsoft than the Power BI story. All right, so it's, it's incredible to see how quickly and how far it's gone. And we're still seeing a lot of announcements coming up of you know, major new changes and features coming. The, the new development pipeline that Microsoft has, the speed that they can put features out, and, and there's no longer big version numbers. It's literally just always new things appearing. I, it, it's quite staggering what, they, what they've done there. Well, it's also quite rewarding because um, I built a lot of content from Microsoft and because software is a service and the Power BI service updates weekly. Yeah. And Power BI desktops on a monthly cycle, it's like, great, I have to keep reproducing content. And yeah. So that means more business. It's going to be challenging to make curriculum, but it's almost like you can't make a book anymore. It's always wrong. Well, it's a risk, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. if you're going to sit down and draw a line and say, that's it, that's the thing that I write for, yeah. by the time it's reviewed, edited, and published, yeah, it's, it's, it's out of date. wildly out of date. Yeah. Right. So that is a frightening concept, but the business model that I adopt is that I also produce training content for my business mm -hmm. and uh, my guarantee is that content is no more than four weeks out, <laughs> which, is, which is sometimes a really painful, right? So, so what is Power BI anyway? So if I were to describe Power BI in a single sentence, yeah. uh, it would be that it's a data visualization service. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Taking data, visualizing it for the benefit of your audience, mm. which are your decision makers that just need relevant, up-to-date, quality visualizations to make good quality decisions. This is the stuff that we used to use charts, graphs, third-party tools to sort of try to come up with some sort of dashboardy thing in the past. 
Now it's just a service we call. I exactly. Well, look, what works better? Do you throw a grid of numbers at somebody or do yeah. you actually you know, decorate those numbers through visualization? Like yeah. a bar chart would normally speak better than just numbers in a grid. Yeah. Uh, it's often a balancing act because you need the two. And so there is, in fact, an entire science without talking about Microsoft's Power BI before mm. you embark on reporting and dashboards. There's some, you know, some sound practices. You know, do you or do you not use pie charts? Yeah. And we could spend an hour even talking about that. I do yeah. We did. Uh, we have. I do own a book called How to Lie with Statistics, which apparently is hard to get your hands on because governments buy them all up. Uh, but uh, yes. it's just, the, what's amazing is the book is from the 40s, huh. right? Like the original versions of it. And they, but these cues of they just as read this the psychological recognition that there are certain visualizations that elicit an emotional response that mm. that override the data at that point. Yeah, like the data is almost irrelevant because you, if you show a line going from bottom left to top right, you know, Western culture people are hardwired to believe this is good. What the numbers say that actually gets you to that line are almost secondary to the point. Mm. But as soon as you go down this path of visualization, you are talking about you, you, you as the creator have to make this decision about how, what are the emotional responses you expect to solicit? What are the consequences? Right. So it's an entire mm -hmm. psychological layer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a technology side that you need to be aware of, but then yes, what, what am I trying to communicate and how best to do that, whether it's for good intention or not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a psychology to consider as well. So, you know, that's, that's not a discussion I get into too deeply because I'm more concerned about the technology itself. Sure. And as a data platform MVP, I'll correct you, I'm not a SQL Server MVP anymore. We were rebranded at some point. Sure, yeah. But as a data platform MVP, and now 12 years, um, you know, uh, my, my focus is on technology and on sharing the passion and knowledge uh, and training people in great, great practices. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like helping people such that they help themselves. That's, yeah. that's the reward for me. Um, so if we're going to focus on Power BI, you know, I'm very Microsoft, by the way, so I'm, I'm terrible at conversations about compete, you know, what yeah, does Power right. BI look like compared to Tableau and, and right, yeah. that's just not what I do. Um, because if you're going to focus on data platform these days with Microsoft, you know, it's, it's hard enough keeping up with all of that. So with Power BI, um, the way I like to talk to my customers about it is that it is a data visualization service. And it's somewhat unique in that it's a software as a service, right? Mm -hmm. So it's BI as a service. And we're already seeing a very strong trend, uh, with my customers at least, that they're moving away from the traditional on-prem servers, installing a stack of you know, services and driving their BI from there. Right. I mean, we already see announcements that SharePoint and others are deprecating BI features and so on. And there is this move and customers are willing now to move their um, visualizations into the cloud. Mm. And so Power BI, is essentially software as a service for business intelligence. Uh, it provides the ability to connect to pretty much any data source that you have. Hmm. So I don't actually have to have my data in the cloud. I could be doing these analytics off of on-premises data stores. This is hmm. this is the story. So right. I would I would say any modern data store. So whether it's SQL Server or Oracle or Teradata, all your relational systems, be them on-prem or IaaS in a VM. Mm -hmm. um, direct connectivity to them via gateways, of course, cloud services, right. um, internet stores, and software as a service providers. So pretty much uh, the modern challenges we have today about connecting to data and also integrating data from different stores and formats was primarily built into the service itself. So you could expect that it can connect to your data. And as a developer where it doesn't, there's an extensibility story. So just develop your own connector Right. And then and then have it um, load your data from there. Mm. So th the main story is, yes, it will connect to a wide variety of data stores and data formats. Um, but your other concern then is as a cloud service. Well, how do people get to it? Mm -hmm. And that's the easy story then, because you've got a web portal or you've got some fairly rich mobile applications written for, you know, your iOS, your um, Android devices and okay. Windows. Mm. Um, even the Apple Watch has its own Power BI app. I can show mm. the graph. <laughs> well, no, how cool is this? It's like, oh, excuse me, I've got a buzz. There's something exceeding a threshold, right? Yeah, right? yeah. So the next level of discussion that I'd have about Power BI is knowing that it's a cloud service for bridging your decision makers to the data, no matter where the data is, mm -hmm. is that there are two distinctly different experiences that Power BI delivers. They have dashboards and they have reports. And this is where I need to be very careful because people already have a definition of a dashboard. Sure. They will develop a report that to them is a dashboard, and that's perfectly legitimate. Okay. Report to me says read only, right? Dashboard really? seems a little more, I mean, I'm guessing, 
The um, dashboard to me seems a bit more interactive. It's actually the other way around. Really? Hmm. Yeah. So the dashboard is like when you think of driving a car, you know, the concept of a dashboard is that you need key metrics and you don't need to be distracted by detail. I see. All right. Do I yeah. need to know what's going on second by second with the temperature of the engine? Okay. Probably not. But I, might, I want a summary of that. And mm. certainly to avoid parking or speeding fines, I need to know what speed I'm doing right now. How much fuel do I have? And if the fuel is critically low, I want to be alerted to that. Mm, right. So the concept of a dashboard is really about a passive, more monitoring experience. Okay. Uh, and so from a Power BI point of view, a dashboard is a, a collection of tiles. And those tiles are guaranteed to give you up-to-date information, as up-to-date as the service can reasonably deliver. Right. And so you could think that a dashboard might be an unattended monitor in a server room. Yeah. It just sits there and people mm. monitor it. In fact, one of the best examples I've seen of a dashboard is just walking around Microsoft's campus in the engineering areas. Mm -hmm. So probably a lot of people aren't aware, but if they agree to the privacy terms with a lot of Microsoft software, there's a lot of telemetry mm -hmm. data that is being mm -hmm. fed up to the cloud somewhere. And that's really fascinating for the engineers because let's just say, for example, they add some new feature to a ribbon in Excel. Right. Are people using it? Yeah, that's a great question to ask. Yeah. So there's telemetry that's collecting that if you agree and opt into the privacy. Mm. Now, walking around like the coffee break areas, they have these huge monitors. They're totally non-touch devices, so it's a passive monitoring experience. Right. And there's literally hundreds of tiles showing things like usage of features. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what Power BI intends a dashboard to be. I want you to hold that thought for just a moment while we take a minute for this very important message. Hi, this is Richard. The Dev Intersection Fall Show this year will be December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel. The lineup is awesome. Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, yes, all the Scots. But also a ton of great industry speakers for some insight on what's coming up in the world of .NET. You know, Core 3 is bringing client technology like WinForms and WPF into play. Could it be time to migrate your existing desktop apps to this new technology? Come learn more at Dev Intersection, December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. Go to devintersection.com to register and use the code .NET Rocks to get a discount. And uh, it's .NET Rocks. We're back. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. And that's Peter Myers. And we're talking about Power BI. Just define dashboards as being the sort of uh, high-level overview, uh, a read-only kind of panel that uh, gives you a good summary of what's going on. So... A report. Well, if I'm to associate a verb with a dashboard, I would say monitor. Right. Monitor. If I associate a verb with a report, it's interact. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the way that Power BI intends a report to work is that it's there to support your discovery and exploration. So you'll find that there's a core visual called a slicer that sits visually on a page. And that provides interactive um, filtering and slicing across the page itself. Mm. Of course, page navigation comes into effect on a multi-page report. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the ability to sort. Uh, we have the ability to cross-highlight. There's all my months. There's clicking on January. Okay, cross-highlight and show me how January impacted on the other visuals of this page. Right, okay. And even Q&A, which is a feature of dashboards too, uh, but the ability to ask natural language questions. Mm. and have responses in visualization form. Yeah. All right, so it means also, and I love this feature, is that you don't have to like write lots of reports. Right. You write your basic reports, and then you encourage people to ask those, you know, ad hoc questions that come up. So it's really not, I mean, a report is something, here's a report, you know, in parlance, but it's an application, really. So it comes back to how you describe a report, mm -hmm. because in business intelligence, we'll often refer to reports as analytic reports. They're, they're more concerned with filtering, grouping, and aggregating and providing a summarized view. Yeah. And that's why we saw the birth of technologies like OLAP, mm. was to provide that you know high speed, high performance over large volumes of data. Mm. Uh, in contrast to an analytic report, you have operational reports, and they're more interested in row by row detail, you know, a pick sure. slip for, an in, you know, for a warehouse uh, an invoice for a customer. Now, that's not an analytic report. In, by the nature of its query, mm. uh, it's, it's quite different. So I wouldn't be using Power BI to produce an invoice. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just not that type of system. It's an analytic reporting That's more system. of a yeah, yeah. uh, reporting services role. And Correct. So reporting services has traditionally been, been both, to be honest. Before right. we had the newer technologies, we would do dashboard-style reports and reporting services. Mm -hmm. And, of course, alongside, we've got our operational-style reports. 
And there's nothing to stop you still doing that, which is why back to the definition of, of what you or your customer might refer to as a dashboard or report, you know, I always listen to what they call it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I translate that to, well, that's what Power BI delivers. Mm. You might use a Power BI report to deliver your dashboard, and sure. that's perfectly legitimate. Okay. But I make it very, very clear that when I talk about Power BI dashboards and reports, that's the type of content. And Microsoft have an intent that, you know, one's monitoring one's interaction. Right. And there's a lovely partnership between the two of them because what you find is that the way that you know humans think and they've got to answer a question um, it might be driven from a, a monitoring perspective like what's going on right and the dashboard's great for just tell me the key metrics of what i'm responsible and even for. highlighting metrics that are out of shape in some way well well they can do that like mm -hmm. the you know the gas levels yeah, low blinking will red. alert you to that and in fact dashboards support uh, the ability for users to configure alerts mm -hmm. and the apple watch will tell you that something's um, you know, exceeded a threshold. Hmm. But where that question evolves from, hey, things are going okay, or well, maybe not, right. you can click on the tile of a dashboard and it will click through to the report, yeah. which then provides that experience of, well, let me explore. What's the root cause of that, that value that I see there? Yeah, I mean, the gas gauge example is obvious, but you also automatically know the answer. I mean, the far more difficult thing is, you know, sales are down 10%, like we're off our numbers. And then there's this question like, why? And you've got to, you need to start drilling and, and digging through data to try and figure exactly it. So you want interaction, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You want to mm -hmm. slice and dice and find that answer. So, so that's that's the story. Like Power BI will provide those two experiences. Mm -hmm. We'll find that some customers don't use the dashboards. That's not of interest to them, or they're not ready for that just yet. Um, certainly, reports are core, as in that interaction experience is what most people expect of a BI reporting tool. Right. Okay, and so when it comes to the developer story, and that's why I've been invited to this conference, by the way, I feel like a bit of a black sheep here mm -hmm. at NDC, uh, and it's not that I'm not welcome, but it's like I'm here to talk about data and analytics mm -hmm. from a developer perspective, mm. and uh, so I'm not here to talk about C Sharp or the latest you know, techniques for programming, sure. and I've left those days well behind. I'm still a developer, but mm -hmm. that's not my core core work, so I'm not even up to speed with it. I feel like I'm light years behind. Well, what, I, what I see is the agenda this here. This is constant new, new things coming along, but Power BI has changed a lot in the past few years too. I mean, well, well, it has. Now, it's evolved to a service that is also um, embeddable. Right. And that's the key message that I've delivered in a session yesterday, uh, and we've had some workshops on it today. So, in fact, if I were to use my four fingers, there are four things that I think appeal to developers when it comes to Power BI. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first is the ability to embed. Right. So all of that great content, whether it's dashboards, reports, even a single tile on a dashboard or a single visual on a page of a report, mm -hmm. and even the Q&A experience that I described to you, the natural language querying, right. those five types of content can be embedded into an application. Are they the five controls or what, uh, what's the embed It's essentially like? a div on a web page. Okay. And then it uh, just injects its magic into that div. So we'll use an iframe. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so embedding is really probably the major story for the developer is, you know, whether you've got existing visuals, you can upgrade them with a more modern interactive experience, uh, whether you don't have those experiences in your app today and you just want to take your app to a whole new level. Well, with relative ease, you know, the embedding story um, can take you down that path of once you have great content in Power BI is to embed it. Right. So with that story, there's also the client side JavaScript API which has an amazing array of operations allowing you not just to embed, but to uh, automate, you know, page navigation, asserting filters. Mm -hmm. So imagine on one page of the app, you're looking at details of a customer and you say, oh, show me, click on this button to show me uh, their recent sales um, details. Right. So the developer can, you know, navigate to a page with an embedded report and client side enforce a filter. Uh. And it's bi-directional. When the user interacts and clicks on a segment of a pie chart, the application can be informed of that. Right. And the application can do something in response. So there's a remarkable um, ability for the app developer to seamlessly integrate um, beautiful modern uh, analytics and, and provided enhanced application experience. Mm. So that's, that's the embedding story. And I was very fortunate to work with Microsoft on a project that we called um, Developer in a Day for Power BI. Huh. I produced a day's content, and I would suggest to you that two thirds of that day is just focused on embedding, mm. with the major story being embedding reports, because right. they provide that rich interactive experience. And that's what you know, application developers now, ex application users, excuse me, expect. Now, I'll just, 
say for the other three fingers. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the embedding of Power BI content. Yeah. Um, another really cool capability is the real-time dashboards. So the dashboards are designed to provide up-to-date information. Right. Uh, and we can take it to a whole new level that programmatically we can create data sets and push data to data sets and the dashboards will reflect these almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And for developers, it's a very, very straightforward thing to do and it's very impressive. Uh, so the moment that you can go to a customer and say, well, look, here's your data and here's us providing up-to-date you know, real-time I've oh, got to be careful, near real-time yeah, real, yeah. results, yeah. Then, then this is another thing a developer can do. And it's solely a developer task because it requires working with the Power BI REST API. Mm -hmm. um, so for developers that are familiar with request response programming and who isn't today, it's just a matter of authenticating with Azure AD. Mm -hmm. Once you have that token, then just sending the right JSON documents up to the service. Mm. Nice. All right. So that's number two. Uh, number three is extensibility story. So I've already mentioned extensibility with connectors. Yeah. And, and this isn't a common requirement because Power BI really has a very comprehensive, you know, built-in set of connectors for all modern data sources today. But let's just suggest you've got some really old system mm -hmm. or a proprietary design system and you want Power BI to interact with it. So, you know, a developer and less likely an application developer, but some developer could extend Power BI with a custom connector. Hmm. And then the last finger stands for extensibility again, which is the Power BI custom visuals. And this is where your creativity hmm. can run wild because hmm. if you've got a particular way to visualize data, yeah. well, you can develop that. If you can do it in HTML, then you can develop a Power BI visual sure. to do that. Sure. And it will work beautifully with reports. You can pin to dashboards. Uh, they'll work real time as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we're seeing an amazing amount of creativity coming out. You know, there's a standard um, charts and Sankey diagrams and so on. But, you know, we're seeing that customers, especially large customers that have got the budget and interest. And one example I, I know of is an airline that said, well, we want to see what the passenger load on a plane right. is. I want a visual that's a plane right. that's like a thermometer that sure. we can see the, the mercury telling us how full the load is. So that's just a matter of a web developer essentially oil building tank. up. Well, and, and that's exactly. whatever. Exactly. And I they like can animate as well. So they're, yeah. they're absolutely yeah. super cool. But you're speaking HTML, CSS, JavaScript. HTML5, right. TypeScript, CSS. Right. So with those skills and web drawing libraries, if you've got that background, then uh, there's a framework that allows you to build, test, package up, and then deliver custom visuals. Awesome. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, that's right. It's time to announce the latest in bionic ocular implants for flying insects. Oh. Yep, that's right. Embedded powered bee eyes. <sighs> Okay, that was funny. <laughs> I said embedded, embedded powered wow. bee eyes. No? Oh, now you get it. <laughs> oh, Drew. Oh, Carl, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. okay, well, it's actually time to uh, give away a $200 Amazon gift card. Compliments of progress. To I thought it was funny. It is funny. Uh, <laughs> Progress Telerik to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.net and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing, and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. And new this year is a free online training program for all license holders. And with this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive docs, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, You'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial today at Telerik.com slash download. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Marco Ramos. Congratulations, Marco. <laughs> yes. And Marco Ramos just won a $200 gift certificate from Amazon. Compliments of Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, B-I's, what was I thinking? And uh, <laughs> join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And we also like to ask our guests, Peter, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? 
So I've um, been fortunate to produce training courses from Microsoft and I've worked in their studios. So mm. I, I know what a good setup is like. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they had the awesome ability for me to be standing in front of my PowerPoint presentation like a weatherman. Oh, right. You know, and so I can, and... Cr exactly. And so I guess if I had the budget, I would want that set up at home. Nice. I'm not sure how much $5,000 would be get, mm. but actually mm. a green screen is very easy to set up. Ah, but it's the real time off. technology that lets me see myself superimposed. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the green screen I know is easy, but I understand mm -hmm. that the process is required to provide feedback. Like if I'm looking at the camera. Right, right. To then see myself in front. So when I'm pointing at the You're PowerPoint. You're pointing at the right spot. I'm not yeah. pointing at some random thing on a green yeah, yeah. screen, right? So yeah. I understand that's expensive. That's where not necessarily, yeah, but, but you can you can get expensive. Jeff, Jeff Fritz and Co. You know the, the yeah. Twitch streamers are doing a lot of that these days, where they're yeah. smartly embedded. So it, I think you can get a long way with five grand. So I might have some okay. change left over. Is no, yeah, I don't I know about that. You, you might just be dipping a little extra into the coffers to get that done. But that's a great goal. And I do think it's very, over the years, there's been a few like Channel 9 videos and things where somebody sort of popped into the screen and walked around on Visual Studio and was pointing right. pieces out. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're engaging. It, it's yep. fun to do. Mm -hmm. And I would hope <laughs> it's fun to watch. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's again, another avenue for creativity. So yeah. right. I, I do a lot of teaching. And so if there's a new way to inspire and excite people, I'm, I'm good for it. Well, me, I, I cool. just like the idea of you, this Power BI report being so large that you're walking on it and then you have to sort of jump on the pie <laughs> segment <laughs> to go through to the next piece. All right, we're getting out of control. Uh. <laughs> so yes, I, I've, I've done this. There's a custom visual on that topic that's an aquarium. Right. Uh, it, it's more fun than anything, but it allows you to plot, you know, um, uh, by size of fish <laughs> and, they, and they animate and so so uh, I think that we superimposed myself on that and mm -hmm. I was a scuba diver so uh. <laughs> that, that's what's possible with, with the technology so yes if I had a home set up like that that would be awesome yeah no that'd be really that'd yeah. be really fun well and you're right. pushing against this idea that visuals really bring home information even if they're you know even if they're made up and cartoony swimming fish yeah. tell a story yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah right <laughs> And one of the things I remember from How to Lie with Statistics was that if you use specific objects as part of the graph effect, so say you've got a car, you're, you're looking at car sales going up, because you maintain proportionality in the car when you scale it up, even though it's technically a line or a bar graph, so the bar is going up, because the mm. car will, of course, get wider as it gets taller, it's actually four times the volume for double the height. Mm. And so you actually you are shaping people's perception that right. the number is much larger than it actually is in change mm. because you're using that graphic to grow. Does that make sense? Yes, but are you recommending this? Or no, I'm, I'm saying this is one of the techniques, the, and actually the sample they showed was like a government documentation showing how an industry was growing by making that industry's object, I think it was smelting, larger so that they could emphasize that they had grown the market so much. Mm -hmm. but, but even if it's the size of the visual itself, like the chart, if it's reduced in size, seems less significant. Less significant. Right. So, so there are, I guess there are so many tricks to it. But, yeah. you know, I'd hope, I would hope that people would use it in a way that, you know, conveys honesty with right. the data. And well, I, I definitely, I mean, we're talking about internal reporting. You're trying to give good information to people who need to make, need to understand it, make decisions on it, and you know, change the behavior of the business to emphasize those things. Mm. So it's, you know, I don't know who you want to lie to exactly. Well, you're, you've got a story to tell, and I guess you've got an agenda to deliver. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess it gets tailored around that. Yeah. You, you mm. mentioned pie, when you mentioned pie charts, you were like, and we could talk about that forever. And I do remember on this show we had, and I can't remember who the guest was, Richard, but you probably do because you remember everything. Um, we, we were talking about the problem with pie charts. And, and basically this person was saying, never use them. Yeah. Because they're very hard to actually get, especially when you get into small slivers, any kind yeah. of significant information. Well, never say never. So mm -hmm. I, I will draw an exception, you know. Okay. We also have donut charts, by the way, which is just a pie chart with a hole oh. in the middle, but the same rule, the same rule applies. And I yeah. have, I think they work very effectively in limited way, in limited situations. Like, uh, if we had a binary, like gender was male or female. Right. Yeah. Then you two, can, you, you can see, you can determine the two. But the moment you've got three, Mm. or more, mm. it does become challenging. Now, your objective is to convey meaning from the data, not to introduce confusion or ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So the other problem with pie charts, of course, is negative values. So right. they're not useful in certain situations anyway. But I have no issue with pie or donut charts being used if it's uh, one or the other. Right. Or the shape of the data has got to be relevant. The challenge, of course, is that the shape of the data may have been relevant with the set you were starting with. 
But a year from now, the data may be very different. Now that is well, if you've got an attribute that's a yes, no, yeah. and there's not a maybe in yeah, there, right. then then it, then it will continue to work okay, I would guess. You would hope. <laughs> Yes, unless there's shades of yes and yeah. shades of no coming in at some point. <laughs> We're getting point. into a yesy world. Right? <laughs> yes. Yes-ish world? <laughs> No-ish. <laughs> uh. So um, what I did want to talk about, too, because mm. the embedding story is the most important story. Right. And, and if there's a message to developers about embedding, uh, the first thing you need to understand about Power BI embedding is there's actually two types. Right? So there is the embedding, which we refer to as embedding on behalf of the user versus embedding on behalf of the user of your app. Hmm. And this is an often confused topic, and I think I'd really like to make it clear sure. here. While I've already described that embedding can be achieved, um, the scenario of embedding on behalf of a user is really simple and not common, so let me get that out of the way, is that your Power BI user today can go to powerbi.com, sign in, and access the content that they have rights to. Right. You could choose to build an application where they authenticate using their account and they see the content they would ordinarily see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not a common scenario, but we might see an example such that an organization says, we don't like the look and feel of Microsoft's portal, we want our own look and feel. Right. Now that's what we refer to as SaaS embedding. Right. Right? No special requirement because the authenticated user has a license and has access already. Mm. The much more interesting and more common scenario is the PaaS embedding. Okay. That your application has its own identity store, you're going to authenticate them in the way that your application already has, but those users will not have a Power BI license. Mm. Power BI has no idea who they are right. because Power BI expects all accounts to be Azure AD accounts. Mm -hmm. right? So this is the common scenario that developers will face. So the discussion there at that point is there are special licensing requirements because you need to have the right licenses in place. Uh, and then there's considerations for how you're going to manage security and such forth. So the common story is going to be the PaaS embedding. You'll then need to consider licensing, which says you'll look at Microsoft's Power BI premium license, mm -hmm. or you have the ability to work with Azure resource as well. Mm. And so I'm not sure how deep you'd want to go into conversation, but... I think the licensing is kind of important there. I think it is. You are having multiple users accessing Power BI, but they don't necessarily all have accounts on your system. They certainly don't have them on the Power BI site. Well, if they're coming via your application, even right. if they have a Power BI account, it's irrelevant. Right. If you're using PaaS embedding, mm -hmm. all right? So that is a common scenario in multi-tenanted applications. This is, this is the way it works. Sure. You authenticate your user, let them in, and then let them have access to you know, reports and limit the data that they have access to based right. on who they yeah. are, what tenant they belong to. So the requirements when you're going to work and develop and embed in this way uh, is that you will need license for it and mm -hmm. it's going to cost you. All right, so... Is it by the number of users that are using it? Or? So, yes and no. So, mm -hmm. so that's where it gets a little tricky. So let me know if I go too deep. If we went for the Power BI Premium license, it's actually a tenant license. It's not a per user license. Okay. okay. And what you're actually getting for that license is capacity. All right. So uh, we have P1 through 6, I think uh, P345 or 234. No, P1234. Okay. You're getting dedicated capacity in a data center. Now that gives you scale and performance. It gives you the ability by license to embed in a PaaS scenario. It gives you the ability to broadly distribute at lower cost because when you've got your content on a premium capacity, you can share it with free Power BI users. Okay. Mm. As opposed to the Power BI Pro license, which is required by authors and is required if your content is not on premium capacity, okay. then everybody involved in the sharing will need a Pro. So wow. within the context of PaaS embedding, uh, a premium capacity. Mm -hmm. If you've got your content, your data sets, reports and dashboards stored on a dedicated capacity, uh, then you can go ahead and embed it. The other concept is you could fire up an Azure Power BI embedded resource. Mm. And it sort of behaves in the same way, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a different pricing. Uh, okay. it's a what is the difference between the tiers? Is it, is it number of simultaneous users? So, okay, so if you're talking about the PSQs, yes. uh, they basically give you a scale performance. Okay. So CPU memory, mm -hmm. and that's super important for uh, your data sets because large data sets, if they're import models, they're ho they must be hosted in memory. Right. And the more models you have, the more pressure they'll put on memory. So it ultimately does really kind of come down to users or load, simultaneous load. Well, well, here are the considerations, and it's actually quite complex because it will depend on the number of data sets, the type of data set. Mm -hmm. yeah. So by default, a data set is like an import. The data is imported into the service, 
And for the high performance querying that we expect, it must be in memory. That's right. the way the technology works. Mm. But there is another way to produce a data set known as a direct query model. And direct query is simply metadata. And when Power BI hits the model, queries are sent down to the yeah. source system, right. typically relational systems, whether they're via gateways or an Azure SQL database. Right. Now, resource-wise, it's quite different because you'll find the in-memory model, the import, puts pressure on memory, sure. and the direct query a lot of pressure on processes. Mm. So with those basics out of the way, of course, how many of these you have within the capacity, and then when you even look at the report design, you know, like you see some pages of a report, they might have 50 individual visuals. Well, at minimum, that's 50 individual queries. Right. And as we change a slicer from this year to last year to look at history, there's 50 individual queries that are being sent off. And of mm. course, users are somewhat you know, demanding. I expect a response in less than five seconds, if not three, two, two or one. Yeah. 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 And so, if I don't get it, I'm going to click on something else and kick off more queries. Right. <laughs> so what you're getting between P1 to 6 is that you're getting performance and scale, like right. how much memory, how much CPU. Mm. And so the number of things you need to consider will be the number and type of models, the number of concurrent activity, Mm. All right, and then when you look at the activity, what's the typical design of a report? Like, yeah, how many I can queries would this fire is tough off? to assess? Like, it's gonna you're probably gonna buy low and sort of look at how things are constrained and maybe upgrade over time. That would be that would be the advice because uh, you've got to yearly commit on the P SKUs as it is. So Thanks start too. at a P one, see where you go. But there are other considerations. So we're going to see reporting services RDL reports coming into these capacities as well, right. become a premium feature. So they're going to take a chunk of resources as well. So if you engage that and turn that feature on, well, you've got less to play with your model. Right. And then your other consideration is, because wait, there's more, is that if it's an import model, well, that data is only as current as the last refresh. Mm. Sure. So you've got refreshing activity that is scheduled going on at the same time. Mm. So there's so many variables at play here that it's difficult at first glance to go, well, that's the skew that I need. So yeah, your I'm advice is actually quite good. Sure. Start low, I, and then see where you go. Up. I could also see that being incredibly seasonal. Like anytime you're coming into a quarterly report, analytics are going to jump through the roof. Anytime you're coming into major market opportunity, like coming into Christmas for, for e-commerce, analytics is going to jump way up. Like, you think it would work that way, but actually I don't see those patterns. Oh, really? This, okay. There's these spikes, to be honest. You yeah. know, is there this end of month spike? Maybe with operational reporting, you mm -hmm. might more see that. But you know, the day to day questions and decision making, you'll sure. find it's sort of, you know, I would think within an organization, you sort of see, it sort of evens out to become a reasonable, I won't say flat, but not spiky. Not do, too spiky. Do they yeah. scale out um, these resources? So, so certainly we can scale up. So yeah. you know, moving from a P1 to P2 gives you more resource, gives you more memory, allows you to use larger data sets. Right. Uh, the scale out story is just achieved by buying multiple capacities. I see. So if you find that you don't have enough here, let's create another capacity, and this application is dedicated mm. to this capacity. But it's not like as easy as scaling out a web resource, for example. You just turn them on and they just uh, so so yeah there wouldn't be this concept that we could replicate yeah in that way it's when, actually, when demand is high like like you were talking about yeah mm -hmm. it's a different type of scale right. you you know when you're scaling data yeah. you know often you've got a single version of it so you know it's a matter of how do I make you know sure. can I fragment it yeah or you know if necessarily duplicate it but yeah, then you've got an issue of synchronization so it's more like uh, the constraints around a database uh, a SQL server database yeah. for example but you can set up distributed read if you think you need it with with synchronized write and generally on the analytics side it's almost all read so mm. you're making multiple copies of the data correct so it's an answer to your question yes you could yeah, but before yeah. you embarked on that you'd go well like can I just uh, break it down by subject area yeah. mm. and then and then scale out that way but you, you have those options and more recently you can even scale to different um, data centers mm -hmm. so if it's important mm -hmm. that certain data resides in Europe and certain resides in the US sure. uh, we can create Actually, capacities geolocated. Um, does Cosmos DB play much into this? Is that a, is that their tight uh, relationship? It's a there? supported source. It's so, a supported source. So when it comes to Power BI, I'd be very surprised that Microsoft wouldn't support yeah, would their current yeah, sources. Yeah. So you could expect that any Azure Data Service, uh, Access, SharePoint List, mm -hmm. SQL Server, they're, they're all <laughs> yeah. supported. Um, yeah. But while we're talking about capacities, that's the premium story. Right. Um, the Azure story and why it differs and why you might consider an Azure resource, because like the P1, P2, P3 is the same as the Azure A4, A5, A6. Okay. So the reason that you might consider Azure is that it's a pausable service. And therefore, you can turn it on and off. You know, right. you know that the customer right. is only doing analytics between 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. will save you money and mm -hmm. turn it off. Right. Now, on an hourly rate, it works out to be more than the premium. 
which is an annual commit, mm -hmm. but you might work out according to the usage patterns that that could be the case. Right. And something interesting to note for developers is that if you're going to work with PaaS embedding, uh, Microsoft will give you some free embed generations. Mm -hmm. All right, so normally you need to pay for it. You need a capacity to generate embed tokens to embed reports and dashboards. Um, there's an unannounced number that are free. So it allows a developer to get in there, play around with it on their Power BI account. I'm not sure what the limit is, but at some stage you'll get errors. At that point, you might consider firing up an A1 Power BI embedded resource, which is one US dollar an hour. Mm -hmm. It certainly won't scale, and it's not really intended for production use, but if you want a low-cost dev environment, yeah, know. you know, 24 bucks a day if you want to run it for 24 yeah, yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the story. And then when you're ready to move to production, you could change the app workspaces that have your Power BI content mm -hmm. and direct them either to another Azure resource or to a premium capacity. All right, so that would be a consideration to get you started, to set up a test and development environment. Mm. But this is one of those examples of cloud architectural models, right? Where we can give you a very cheap version, but otherwise functionally identical. And then uh, with no significant changes, just the deployment rules are different. Mm. Right. Got a lot more horsepower available. Well, this would be important for stress testing. Like, do we sure. commit to a P1? And what if, what if it just doesn't work for us? Yeah. We'll fire up an A4, which is the same you know, set yeah. of resources, and then you can simulate a load against it, yeah. and maybe just run it for 24 hours. Yeah, and, see what, and see if it's fast enough. And, and then it if it works or it doesn't work, it's... shut it down, and that's yeah. the end of the expense. Sure. And then you've made a decision, and then if it worked out, well now we'll commit to Now we commit to the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, it's still in discussion, but I'm talking to Microsoft at the moment about a white paper, because this topic is, is very relevant. Power sure. BI premium sizing, like how much is enough for what we know? need. So, so that's in discussion at the moment, and if all things go well, look out for that white paper in the next one to two months. Sure, yeah, sounds yeah. good. So what's next for you? What's in your inbox? What are you doing? Uh, what's next? I'm, uh, well, I'll head home to Melbourne tomorrow night. Nice. Yeah. Uh, just in time to wash my clothes, repack, and head to Ignite. Right. Yep. I'm yeah. up to Ignite as well. So. Absolutely. So that's uh, so you're heading straight there, I would guess. I'm, uh, a quick hop through Vancouver to do some laundry and then uh, and Aye, to Orlando. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So Ignite, and then I got a week in New York, which is the Harry Potter experience. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and then to Seattle for a week uh, with Microsoft. And I'll be popping up to Vancouver to speak at the .NET user group nice. on Power BI for developers. Oh, so I a great think idea. That's, um, <laughs> ah. That'll be like, I think, the second week of October, something like the 10th or the 11th. It's a mm -hmm. Friday lunchtime session, so I'm not sure if you can put a plug in there for the .NET user group in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, but I'll be up talking did. about this and demoing about embedding at that point in time. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so the next three, four weeks on the road doing what I do best. Yeah, it's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Peter Myers, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rock. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the MCC. Yes, I'm a, a toy boy. Life is hard.